Happy Father's Day. It's a fun day. It's a hot one out there. And so I, I, maybe I'm going to spoil the surprise, but we're going to have dad's root beer out there for you on your way out. So make sure you stop and grab a, grab a cold dad's root beer on your way out for the ride home. Uh, stop by and, and see the, if you missed the Harley in the, <laughs> in the lobby, make sure you stop and look at that. There's a couple other cars out there, you know, dad stuff, that sort of thing. Uh, we're continuing in the series uh, called This Is Living Now, where we are going through the book of Philippians. We're wa- working through this thing from beginning to end, and we're, we're coming towards the end here. This entire book, it's a, it's a fairly encouraging book uh, to, this, to this church in Philippi that was near and dear to Paul's heart. They seem to have this, this friendship of sorts, and he seems to really uh, be encouraging them to continue doing what it is that they are doing. And so the question that we are asking is, what, what can we learn from these people? What can we learn from these people as they are following Jesus well? And how, how are we to do those same types of things? And so that's where we're going this morning. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 2. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Otherwise, it will be on the screen as well. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 2, going through verse 9. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Synctity pause there. If you don't know how to say it, just say it fast and with confidence. Nobody will question you, okay? I entreat these people, these women, to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Last month on May 7th, 2018, the American Psychiatric Society released a study And uh, the title of the article that I was reading summarized the findings, and this is what the title of the article said. Americans say that they are more anxious than a year ago. Baby baby boomers reported the greatest increase in anxiety. And so what the study did is they they surveyed a bunch of people, and they asked them about these five different areas of their life, uh, health, safety, finances, relationships, and politics. And they asked them to, to rate how anxious they were feeling. And, the, this year, and they do this just about every year. This year's anxiety score was an average of all of those different scores across all those different uh, categories uh, was 51 out of 100. So we are 51% anxious on a scale of, of 100. But that's up five points since last year. These increases in anxiety scores were seen across all age groups, across people of different races and ethnicities, among men and among women, by generation, because they break this up by by generation too, millennials, my people, continue to be the most anxious, more than Gen Xers or baby boomers. However, baby boomers' anxiety increased the most with a seven-point jump from last year, between 2017 and 2018. In June of last year, there's an article that Psychology Today released. Uh, one, of the, one of the lines here says this, our society has seemingly become one where the diagnosis of anxiety now rivals that of depression. Anxiety is starting to seem like a sociological, sociological condition too, a shared cultural experience. 
Google will allow you to do this really fun thing where you can you look up what are called trends. <clears throat> so it's a tool that they provide. You can go and you can do you can do this search for anything. And so you you type in a, a specific phrase. So let's say you want to do a search on watermelon. You go and you want to see how often watermelon is searched and how often it's been searched from since Google started until present, and then it will, will chart that data on there. The highest point, it will scale that as like 100, and then everything else falls down. So I went in and I did a Google trend search uh, about anxiety, and this is what it showed. So this is from January 1st on the left side, and then to January 1st, 2010 on that side, 2018 on the right side. It's, it has 100 listed as around October, of 2017, and then at January 1st, 2010, that number is just below 50. So what that tells us <clears throat> is that the number of times that people have been searching for anxiety since 2010 has doubled. The number of times that people go to Google and they type in something about anxiety, the word anxiety, has doubled since 2010. All of these things seem to be pointing towards this fact that we are and are continuing to become an anxious people. And maybe this isn't shocking to you because maybe you have started to feel some of those things over the past few years too. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is as people of Jesus, as people who follow Jesus, what are we supposed to do with that? And that's where Philippians chapter 4 comes into play. Now, a couple of disclaimers before we officially start this conversation. This is a huge, huge conversation. There are tons of different aspects to this. And I'm a pastor. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. And so I'm coming at this from a pastoral lens. We're not going to cover all the different aspects of this, and what I really would love for this conversation to be is really a start of this conversation, that you would continue to have, have this conversation about anxiety and what are we supposed to do as followers of Jesus with your family, with your community group, with your friends, with your colleagues who are also following Jesus seeking to understand how we can be faithful followers of Jesus in an anxious world. So the big idea for this morning, from a, a pastoral standpoint, is that followers of Jesus are to be a non-anxious presence in an increasingly anxious world. If you walk away with one thing, that's what I want you to walk away with, that followers of Jesus are to be a non-anxious presence in an increasingly anxious world. So we look at Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4, and it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness or your gentleness, is another way that that can be translated, be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> okay, don't be anxious about anything. Question number one, when you read the Bible, what's the context? So who is Paul writing to? in this situation. Well, first off, we know that Paul is writing. Good guy, bad guy. Good guy. We like this guy. Yep. He's writing to a group of Christians in the city called Philippi, and this city is primarily made up of retired Roman military personnel that have been experiencing some level of persecution. And their relationship with Paul is that of friendship. As we've been reading through this letter, we've seen that Paul feels very close to this group of people, to this particular church. And so when Paul writes these words and says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God, it's within that context so they're, they're not only worried about this persecution that they're starting to experience, they're also worried about their friend Paul, who's in prison and very well could be executed. They have some things to be concerned about, and it seems as though their concern for Paul 
and their current situation has turned to worry, and then it's turned into anxiety. And so Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Now, let me be clear. Let this be crystal clear. He is not talking about chemical imbalances that are happening in people's brains. He is not talking about people who have a neurological, biological issue and saying, just stop being anxious. Just, just stop it. Because if you were to tell someone who actually has something like that happening within their brain to just stop being anxious, that's akin to going up to someone with a broken leg and saying, just stop having a broken leg. It doesn't work that way. And so if you're here and you're taking anti-anxiety medication that was prescribed to you by a doctor, do not hear me say that you should stop taking that and just pray more. Do not hear me say that because that's not what I am saying. I'm not simply telling you to stop being anxious because there's a depth and a complexity to what's going on inside of your body. Capiche? Cool. Now, if you think that you might have clinical anxiety, if you're like, man, I just, I just get wound up so tight and this has been happening for a long time, you know what you need to do? You need to go see a doctor. You need to go and get help, just like if you broke your leg. Go see a doctor, get help. This passage don't be anxious about anything, is specifically addressing specific events that cause concern and to worry and to anxiety and specific cultural pressures that the people at Philippi were experiencing. It's not talking about neurological, biological, chemical imbalances in your brain. Are we clear? Thank you. Very good. Disclaimer out of the way. God says, don't be anxious about anything. What's included in the umbrella of anything? Everything, which is the exact same word that he uses. So, but don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, what's included in everything? Anything. You see how this starts to work together? Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, Make your requests known to God. So these Philippians were experiencing this anxiety because of their cultural pressures and because their friend is in prison, possibly going to be executed. And Paul says, don't worry about it. Don't be anxious about this, but pray about it instead. Go to God in prayer. Not just general prayers like, God, I pray that you would take care of us. No, like pray for Paul specifically. Pray for people by name, specific types of prayers. And then that leads to the question of, well, why, okay, why, why pray? Don't be anxious, but pray. Okay, why? God hears our prayers. That's the simple answer, is that God hears our prayers. Job chapter 42, verse 2 says, I know that you can do all things. Job talking to God says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. That if you say that you are going to do something, God, that that is exactly what is going to happen. God hears our prayers, and God can do all things. Now, this leads to a question about how does God control his creation? How does God govern his creation? Because one of the lines when bad things happen or we're not sure about a situation that people will say is, well, God's in control. Well, what do you mean by that? What exactly does that look like? What about the decisions that I have to make on a daily basis? Is God just controlling those things like a puppet master? And this becomes a really complicated conversation. Conversation for another day, let's get coffee or lunch and talk about it. That would be lovely. We're not gonna have that conversation today because regardless of where you stand on that issue, Regardless of where you stand, and within Jesus-loving evangelical Christianity, there's a lot of different answers to that. But the one thing that all of those people agree on is that God is all-powerful, God is personal, and God is working out his purposes. So we pray because we know that God is all-powerful. We pray because we know that God is personal, that he is near to us, he's not distant 
And we pray because we know that God is working out his purposes. And Paul's reflected on that previously in this book. For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Doesn't matter which, if I live or die, God is going to have his way and be glorified in it. And I'm totally okay with whatever happens. So he's saying when, when these things happen that cause us anxiety, when, when the Philippians get news that Paul is in prison, what they are to do is acknowledge that they are anxious, pray, and then rest in who God is and that they are one of his children. Everything that comes our way is known to God and he is for us and not against us. We choose to move away from anxiety. We choose to not engage with that, but to trust in God's plans and purposes. It's pretty simple and incredibly difficult. Don't be anxious about anything. Instead, pray about it. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. So that's what we are to do. When those specific things happen and they cause us to, they, they're cause for concern. And everybody has those things. There are things that should concern us. What those concerns should not move into is worry and anxiety. Instead, when they are concerning to us, we are to pray. We pray to God specific types of prayers about this specific situation. But what happens if there's like not a specific situation that you can like put your finger on that says, you know what, that's what's, that's what's causing this worry and this concern and, and could become anxiety if I let it. There's this, this term called ambient anxiety. And this is, the, this is the idea that I, well, I can't quite put my finger on what's causing me anxiety like this situation. I find out that Paul's in prison. Oh my goodness, I'm concerned for his well-being and that moves me towards anxiety. Ambient anxiety is different than that. There's not a specific catalyst that moves us into that. It's more of a cultural pressure. It's more of what the Philippians would have been experiencing with their persecution. It kind of feels like the world is in, a, is in a tailspin and things are just spiraling out of control and you're not quite sure where to even start or what way is up. Has anybody ever felt that type of anxiety before? That ambient type of anxiety? A couple of weeks ago, I'm, uh, I'm on Facebook, you know, like you do, and I'm doing the Facebook scroll, I'm scrolling through stuff and I'm I'm listening to this podcast while I'm, while I'm looking at Facebook, and as I'm scrolling through Facebook, I'm seeing these pictures of people on vacation, and it looks like it's a really fun time, and then I scroll down a little more, and there's these videos about this natural disaster, this, this volcano in Hawaii that's, that's erupting, and basically the whole island is going to explode from the way they're talking about it, and, and then I scroll down a little bit, and there's another video about how to pour a Coke without getting fizz really helpful types of information on the Facebook. And then there's this other article about, uh, about sex trafficking and some of the statistics about sex trafficking and what we can do to, to fight against sex trafficking. And as I'm listening to this podcast, and this podcast is called uh, This Cultural Moment, you can go and you can listen to it. There's a, a number of episodes. I think they're like on episode eight. Um, it's these two pastors yeah, I'd sit down and they have a conversation about uh, the current state of things, some of the, the specific situations that are unique to this partic particular cultural moment. Uh, the one guy, his name is Mark Sayers. He's, at a, he's a pastor of a church in Melbourne, Australia. He's really fun to listen to. And then this other guy, his name is John Mark Comer. He's a pastor of a church in Portland, Oregon. And as they're talking about this, and as I'm scrolling through, through Facebook, they're talking about this idea that our world has gotten smaller. And this is what they said. They said, 100 years ago, and these numbers aren't exact, but it helps to emphasize the point. 100 years ago, the, the average person's circle was about a half a million people. So about like 500,000 people. And that was the people that you would experience things with. 
So when there are storms that happen, you would experience it with those type of people, and they tend to be the people that you live in the same region as. So there's a storm in Madison, like we experience that with the people in Madison. Or when the Packers win or lose, which never happens, we experience that with the people that are around us, and we experience things like winter and summer and fall that last for two weeks, and we experience this as a group of people of about 500,000 people. And then we would hear about things that happen like across the country or on the other side of the world by reading about it in a newspaper. We would read about this, the words that this reporter wrote about something that happened. And we, Man, that's really, that's really terrible. The difference is that now, in 2018, we don't experience the world with 500,000 people. We experience the world with 7 billion people. Not only do we hear about the things that are happening in our region, we hear about things that are happening across the world, but, and not only do we hear about them, but we experience them. We experience those things in real time as they are filmed by people, and then they are streamed. Why is my flashlight on? Goodness, sorry about that. I'm not anxious about it, don't worry. But people literally on the other side of the world, they pull out these little devices and they film what's happening. And within milliseconds, I can see it from my house in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Not only am I seeing it, but I'm seeing it from a first person standpoint. It's almost like I'm there. We experience these things with 7 billion people, not just 500,000 anymore. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Probably some combination of both, right? It's a good thing, certainly, no doubt, because we're global citizens. We know the things that are happening around the world, and we can do something about it. Specifically, as Christians, we're aware of issues and injustice that are happening on the other side of the world, and we can either personally work against those issues, or we can support groups that are going to do that. But the downside of being so connected is that we start to see how much brokenness there is in the world. It's not contained to this 500,000 people that I experience life with. I'm experiencing all of it all at the same time. And this has happened within the past 50 years. We can become paralyzed by how many bad things there are in the world. We start to really feel and experience how broken this world is. And part of it is that We haven't adjusted to taking in this much information. We know all about all of these different issues that we weren't aware of before, but the reality is that it's not really anything new. We're just aware of it because our circle is bigger. So we're anxious. We're becoming an an anxious group of people, and more and more so every day. Really, just because our circle has gotten bigger. There's this pastor who lived around 400 AD. Uh, His name was Augustine. And he wrote wrote this book. It's a big, fat book. Um, And I'm going to summarize it in like two sentences. So obviously I'm going to miss some things. But Augustine, uh, this book is called City of God. It's actually a book of, I think it's 22 different books that are compiled here. Yep, 22 different books, just over 1,000 pages, some light reading for your Father's Day Sunday afternoon. Pick it up on Amazon. Augustine is writing under the Roman Empire around 400 AD, and he writes to Roman citizens, specifically to Roman Christians, who were experiencing this cataclysmic shift that was causing all of this anxiety. You see, Rome was on the brink of collapse. This empire that had stood for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years 
was on the brink of collapse. And throughout this whole thing, he tackles a lot of different topics. But his, his point is that even if Rome, what he calls the city of man, falls, the city of God will never fall. So don't panic. He says that if the city of man falls, the city of God will never fall. So even if the world is crumbling around us, the city of God will never crumble. And so as Christians, as people who are following Jesus, we need to be people who understand and experience this bedrock of Jesus. That as things shift and things feel like they're falling apart, that we know exactly where we are, the safest place that we could possibly be in the hands of our Savior and our King. Things feel like they're falling apart, and we experience all of these things, not just with these 500,000 people, but with 7 billion people, and we start to feel ourselves getting anxious and anxious, and what in the world is happening, and the words that God says to us are, don't be anxious. Remember who I am, and remember that the foundation that you are built upon. We as Christians need to be a non-anxious presence in an increasingly anxious world. Just think about what an incredible witnessing and testimony opportunity that is. If we're walking, talking, non-anxious people because of the bedrock of Jesus, because our faith and our hope is in Christ, think about how that makes us stand out from the rest of the world. Don't be anxious about anything. I've been thinking about, this past week I was thinking about this idea and who I've seen that's done this really, really well. And there were, there were a couple people that, that came to mind, but most recently, most recently there was this, this couple, and their, their names are Ben and Paula Arbaugh. For the past few months, Ben has been battling with cancer, and he's been on this, this journey, and yesterday morning, the Lord called him home. And I can't tell you the number of times that I heard people talking about their situation, and the thing that kept coming up was their faith in Jesus. Jesus and how calm they were throughout this whole process. You see, when we have a reason to be anxious and we choose not to be because of this bedrock of Jesus, it speaks volumes. We hear this call, don't be anxious. And this is, this is really difficult, but we have a choice to make. As you're going through life, as you're experiencing this concern, worry, anxiety, the question and the choice you have to decide, am I going to make is, am I going to choose to trust in this Jesus and who he says he is and he says that he will never fail? Or am I going to say that I don't know if Jesus can deliver on these promises that he's made? Now, most of us, since we're in church, would say, well, obviously, I'm, I'm going to say I'm going to trust Jesus. Okay? Are you? And this becomes the faith exercise. When we're at this crossroads, we decide what we're going to do, especially in the midst of all of these different issues, all these different things that we're really just starting to understand and new things come up every single day as they come up on the news or on Facebook or Instagram or Reddit or Twitter, whatever. As we experience the world with 7 billion people, we focus on all of these different things and what Paul ends with here. He gives us one more tool 
to fight against anxiety. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So think about these things. When there's constantly these things flashing in front of you, begging for your attention, look at how terrible the world is, look at how disastrous the world is, and we're taking in all of this information, think about the things that are good and pure and holy and the things that are worthy of praise. Now, this isn't an excuse to stick your head in the sand and ignore the things that are going on in the world around you. We see time and time again that we are to be a people that care for the widow and the orphan and the the least of these, the people who experience injustice, and we bring justice in Jesus' name. The Prince of Peace. We see those things, but we don't obsess about those things. We don't obsess about the what ifs and the could be's, all the hypothetical situations that could come out of this situation. Instead, we think about the things that are true and just and pure, the things that are worthy of praise and choose to not be anxious, but instead to pray. And then he says, whatever you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. He says, you've seen me practice this. I've done this. I've modeled this for you. Paul's saying to these Philippians, I need you to practice it too. I need you to see these things. I need you to engage with these things and I need you to do it. And so that's the challenge to us is to engage in this faith exercise, to practice being non-anxious. And it's super hard at first. It's super, super hard. But the more we practice, the easier it becomes, just like push-ups. And as we grow, as we strengthen these faith muscles, so to speak, the peace of God will be with us, guarding our hearts and our minds. So don't be anxious, be a non-anxious presence. I'm going to invite Zach and Brian up to lead us in a few last songs here. I talked about this podcast that I was listening to, and one of the, one of the things I wanted to bring up was, uh, as Mark Sayers, this guy from, Aus- from Australia, is, he's talking about uh, this experience that he had, and he was, he was on the west coast of the United States, and then he was flying back home, and he had a layover in Hawaii. And so he's, he has like a 45-minute layover, and so he's in the bathroom, you know, like you do. And he, like, suddenly, like, things start to shake, and he's like, oh, man, they must be doing some construction outside, stuff like that. It's, that's cool. So he gets on the plane, and then he, it's like a six-hour flight. He lands, like, six hours later, in Australia, and he turns his phone on, and he goes on Twitter, and he suddenly realizes that Hawaii just experienced this earthquake, and he's like, oh my goodness, are these people okay? Like, what's, what's happening here? This is, this is terrible, and then he starts to put the timeline together, and he's like, wait, that's what I experienced in the bathroom, and his point is that experiencing it on social media, experiencing this earthquake on social media was worse than experiencing it in person. So practically speaking, one of the big ways that we can become that non-anxious presence in an anxious world is to get off our phones. Because social media doesn't help with this type of thing. So this is how it goes. We're feeling anxious and we're feeling like, man, I gotta, and so we go on Facebook and we do the Facebook scroll and we do the Twitter thing. Like in, in some way, like, Expecting that to be an escape. Expecting to feel better about things as we look at pictures of people, people's vacation and how to pour a Coke without fizz. Like, but as we do this and we go through social media, we realize that it's just contributing to the problem and we start feeling more anxious. And then it becomes this vicious cycle that we spin around on. There's been lots of studies about this and how putting your phone away for even an hour can significantly reduce your anxiety level because it makes our circle smaller again. So this afternoon, 
when you're baking in the sun on this hot Father's Day, hanging out with your family or whatever it is that you're going to do, put away your phone. Think about the things that are worthy of praise, not the chaos, and rest in the fact that God loves us, is for us, and his plans cannot be overcome. So let's stand and, and pray together. Heavenly Father, we know that, that you are God and that you are good. We know that you are working in this world, even if it feels like the whole thing is crumbling around us. Lord, I pray that you would, you would encourage us and, and build those faith muscles in us, that you would help our unbelief as we become anxious about the things that concern us and Lord, that you would be at the forefront, that we would see your beauty and your majesty and just how big you are, that we would rest firmly on the bedrock of Jesus. We know that if this city of man falls, the city of God will never fall. Lord, we trust you and we praise you for who you are and how deep your love is for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.